Well, homecoming and revival, as I said, they have come and gone. A uh, pretty good crowd each night, 44. And uh, Clayton did a fantastic job uh, with uh, the sermons he brought, really good sermons. If you missed it, you missed some dandies. And then there toward the end of the week, I commented how quickly uh, the week had went by. And we think about that, and before you know it, we'll turn around and we'll be planning and getting ready for our trunk or treat uh, ministry. And the next thing you know, we'll be planning out the holidays and and uh, bringing in a new year. It seems that the time does go by very quickly, just like our election season seems to have gotten gone by very quickly. Uh, about uh, seven weeks, we'll go vote here, and, and I believe early voting is beginning. In several states toward the end of this week, so the election is upon us. Uh, tired of hearing the same old stuff from the same old people, and I'll just ask that we be in prayer for our nation, as I believe Tony said in uh, his prayer, and Lynn said in his prayer uh, as well, that uh, what happens for our country is the best, and we'll just leave it at that. Uh, when it comes to, because people, we know we're going to watch the debates if they have any more and people will listen though really I'm not sure that they will hear anything that would change their mind I know for me there's probably nothing either candidate could say that would change the way that I'm going to vote but uh, I wonder as I've thought about that in, in relation to our revival this week sometimes I wonder how people hear good sermons like we did and not have a reaction or we don't know that there was no revival that there was no change because it doesn't have to be something we visibly see it could very well be something that's not visible to us by the eye but I thought too can a preacher any preacher speak words that really changes a person's mind and, and don't get me wrong uh, preaching is important the Bible tells us about preaching but it's only uh, if a person is willing to hear the words that are spoken. And we'll find out here it's more than just that uh, because we know that it's God who speaks. It's God who changes hearts and not man. So the title of this morning's sermon is Who Has Ears to Hear the Lord? And it's important for us to, to understand about what we as believers must do, but also if there are folks here this morning that don't have Christ as their Savior. So turn with me, if you will, over to Mark chapter 4, and we're going to look at uh, verse, start beginning verse 21, and read over through 32, or 34 actually. And these are going to be a passage of scripture that we're familiar with, most likely. <clears throat> Talking about putting the candle under a basket and mustard seed verse 21 Mark records these words of Christ and he said unto them is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or a bed not to be set on a candlestick for there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested neither was there anything kept secret but that it should come abroad if any man have ears to hear let him hear and he said unto them take heed what you hear and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be giveth, given, and he that hath not, from him shall be taken, even which he hath. And he said, So is the kingdom of God. If a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and then after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put in the sickle, because he har the harvest is come. And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare you? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up, and becometh greater than all the herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And with many such parables he spake the word unto them, as they were able to hear it. 
But without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Now notice he talks a lot about hearing here. And that's what I want us to think about. It's the hearing this morning as we look at this. He gives the parable of the soils earlier in the uh, chapter, and we're most likely familiar with that, the two types of soils. Really, it's productive and non-productive soils, hard rocky, thorny soil. And we can relate that to those that do not hear. The other soil produces, if we recall, for 30, 60, 100 fold. And that's a result of those that do hear. And it's really the difference. The true believer are more productive because they hear the truth. But not only do they hear the truth, they believe the truth. And those who don't believe it can't because they will not hear it. One thing I wanted to see uh, was I went back and looked in my uh, dictionary, not actually a dictionary, the uh, concordance that I have. The Greek word that we see in all of these passages for the word here is a koo, A-K-O-U-O. And part of that definition is to understand. So when we put that to this uh, passage and we think about Jesus saying, for those that have ears, let them understand. And for us, too, it makes a big difference because you can hear me talk all day. You can listen to me talk all day and never, and all of us have probably done that. I know I've been accused of, of not listening and, and somebody speaking to me, and I have felt that someone is just, uh, not paying much attention and uh, hearing my mouth but not understanding my words. Well, that's probably common to all of us. But when it comes to the Word of God, it's crucial that we understand what we hear. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to relate not only to his disciples here but to us as well is that we are able to have an understanding of what he's saying so that it can have an effect on us in our life. We must understand that there's nothing more important than the divine truth of the scriptures because that's how we are saved. That's how people are sanctified. That's how people have hope and glory and are instructed in righteousness. That's how we have understanding to come and, and to gather together on the first day of the week and, and take the Lord's Supper. So we understand what Jesus was saying whenever he implemented that with his disciples in the upper room. And that's the defining characteristic of a Christian, is they listen to the God's word, they understand it, therefore they believe it, they love it, and they obey it. Paul said the natural man understands not the things of God, but those who are spiritual have the mind of Christ. And to have to be spiritual, you have to have an understanding. It's the mark of a true Christian. Hear, believe the truth, and understand. In 1 John chapter 10, he says this, again, recording the words of Christ in John chapter 10. I said 1 John, I'm sorry. John chapter 10, 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. If we have an understanding of God's word, then we know the shepherd. If we don't have an understanding of God's word, then we don't know the shepherd. We can sit and we can listen. We can hear but if we don't understand, if we don't allow that understanding to change us to belief and action, then we're not known to Christ. We don't hear him. Again, that three types of soils. Those that don't hear and those that do. Those that hear on the surface, so to speak, and it never sits in. That's the rocky, thorny soils, the hard ground. Oh, I hear it, but it just doesn't have any effect on it. And then the productive soil, those that hear it and allow it to work in their lives, some, some for great results, some for even greater results. And that's the fruits of the Spirit. That's how we're talking about being fruitful as well. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 
Paul writes this and says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So that's another product of hearing and understanding, is that those good works that we are created for, we have an understanding of that. We're going to look at this a little closer here. We have an understanding of that, and we do what we were created to do. So what about this hearing, this listening for those that have ears? Let's go back to our original text in, in Mark chapter 4, and we look at verses 21 and 22 again. He says, a candle is, is a candle, he asked. Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was there anything kept secret, but that, that should come abroad. He's saying, you know, you don't, you don't buy a light and stick a, a basket over it or a bucket over it. It's not going to do what it's intended to do. The light is intended to shine and give light. Parable of the sower, have seed. All Christians have a seed. Do we realize that? All sick Christians have a, a God-supplied basket of seed. But not all Christians sow their seed. We don't really think about it that way sometimes, do we? We all have a talent. We all have a God-given, God-designed purpose, good works. We have that package of seeds in our hand. But until those seeds are sown, they can never do what God intended for them to do. We want to save up our seed for some reason and not sow those seeds. So we need to listen obediently. We need to obey when we hear and understand God's truth. Think about a light in your bedroom in this building. We didn't put these lights underneath the put them up so that people could read and see the books, song books, your Bibles. There's a purpose that those lights have there. And those purposes are to give light to people see. And it's the same way with us as Christians. We think about uh, this past week, the messages that, that Clayton brought and encouraged us as Christians to, to stay on that path, if you remember. Well, part of being on that path is, is shining our light, as Tony had mentioned earlier today. It's shining that light so that others might see. So we have to listen obediently. We have to do what God's word calls us to do. The truth. We have to share it. In the hopes that people will receive it, will understand it as well. Psalm 119, we think about, and I put this in the image in your mind, Psalm 119, 105, you're going to, you're just as soon as I read it, you're going to, you go, oh, that's familiar. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I heard Ernie talking about a, a great grand snake hunt this morning that him and the boys went out on. That kind of reminded me of a time. <laughs> I went snake hunting myself, and, and uh, one of the snakes had, had rolled over off of the gravel road over into the into the ditch, and, and there was enough right of way there. It was kind of grassy. The grass was up high, and, and I went with my buddy, and I'm not going to say who it was, but uh, he's not a very good flashlight tender, I'll say that. Because here we go into the, into the grass to, to find it, and all of a sudden I find myself standing here in the dark, and he's over there with the flashlight pointing that way there's a snake in an unknown place that bites froze. Sometimes if we have a light and we don't share it with people, we, we cause them to do the same thing. That we leave them there. We leave them there hung out to dry, so to speak, as we would say. Not knowing which way to turn because of the dangers, which are some are known and some are unknown. God says that it's a light unto our feet light unto our path, that narrow path that Clayton talks about, that narrow path, how do you stay on the path in the dark? Well, you have to have light. 
You have to have the light to stay on the path so that you can see. And it's going to have twists and turns. I've, I've heard, used this reference many times before, and it, it always amazes me and, and to see the wisdom that God granted to animals. Game trails. A lot of you, a lot of you men and women are, are beginning, if you're not already in the deer woods, you're, you're getting ready to prepare for that. And there's game trails. Those of you that, that farm and raise cattle, you look out through these old established pastures, and what are you going to find? There'll be a path through that. You're taking the easiest path. Though the easiest path, the one that they have less effort, is not straight, is it? It has turns and twists all the time. That's the way our life is. It has twists and turns all throughout our life, but if we stay on the path, we will reach the destination. And that's why the light's so important. So we can stay on the path. And we have to realize and recognize as Christians that our life is not going to be a paved straight road with no turns, no bumps, no curves. It's going to have those. But that doesn't mean that we can't get through those because we have the light. And that light being the truth of God's word and his love as well. We also need to listen with appreciation in our heart. Look at verse 24 and 25. Take heed what you hear. <clears throat> and when you add that word understand to that, take heed what you understand, that adds a little different twist to that. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that, that hear shall more be given, or unto you that understand more shall be given. For he that hath to him shall be given, he that hath not from him shall be taken even that which he hath. So, we, we appreciate the grace that God gives us, the mercy that he has for us. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Paul writes again and says, Be not deceived, God's not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So if we keep our seed and we sow sparingly, if we recall, what happens? We will reap sparingly. If we sow abundantly, what happens? We will reap abundantly. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you have it in this life, I'm not talking about monetary gain. I'm not talking about wealth and riches. Never in the scriptures does Jesus allude to that following him is going to provide you with a, uh, a life that you're going to make all the money in the world and you're going to have the, all these great uh, worldly things, these riches that we people would consider riches today. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about life. He's talking about peace. He's talking about joy. That's what we see in the scriptures and you have it more abundantly. And that's where he's saying this here. Is when we hear and we understand those things, and there's nothing wrong with them. Don't get me wrong. I'm not preaching against that. I'm just saying those things are nice to have, but those are not what we seek out as Christians. We seek out to have peace. We seek out to have joy. We seek out to have hope. And the only way that we can do that with the most abundance is through hearing and understanding God's love for us. So we should have that appreciation in our hearts. Matthew 13, 12 says something very similar. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not... From him shall taken away even that he hath. Do we understand that? If you hear and you understand and you're a Christian and you're serving after and you're chasing after God, you're going to get more peace, more joy, more happiness. But those that do not have Christ, even the happiness they have, eventually that will be taken away. Because someday there's going to be the judgment. And someday you're not going to be able to to rely on the things that the world gives you for that fulfillment. Only the hope that Christ gives us. Only the hope. Luke records these words. 8, 18, he says. Take heed, therefore, how you hear. Take heed how you understand. Remember that. 
For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. Whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth, seemeth to have. See, there's a little difference there. We have the illusion when we're outside of Christ. We have the illusion when we're outside of a relationship with God. We have the illusion, it seemeth, that we have this heaven. We have this joy. We have this peace. And it's temporal. I'm not saying people that, that don't have a relationship with Jesus don't have times in their life that they're happy. Sure they do. I'm not saying that they don't have times when they're, when they're at peace. Sure they do. But when it comes down to the end, when it comes down to the purpose of life, when it comes down to sowing that seed, they lack that, and it only is temporal, only a temporary state. The only way that we can truly have that long-term abundant joy, abundant peace, is to be in Christ with an understanding of the love that God has for us. Life more abundant is only available when it's through Christ. So that should make us hear with appreciation in our hearts as well. Obedience. Back to verse 26 there, Mark 4. So is the kingdom of God if a man should cast seed into the ground? He goes on and he tells us what? The farmer plants his seed and what happens? He goes to bed. That's just like any of us. Anybody that has grown a garden, even if it's just a patio garden in a bucket, right? You plant a seed, you do what you're able to do, and then what happens? You have to leave it alone. It does what God designs it to do. It grows and produces whatever vegetable or fruit it's designed to do. But yet you had to do something, right? And that's the way it is with us. We have to plant a seed. We have to sow our seed as God has given it to us to sow. We have no choice but to do that. But also, once we have sown that seed, once that is that part of my job, you know, there's going to be another that's going to till. There's going to be another that's going to be watering kind of thing, okay? But we know that God gives the increase. Now, like whenever we raise a, a plant, we can, we can, we can hold the garden or, or keep everything clean. We can add fertilizer, make sure it has sufficient water, make sure that it's getting the right kind of sunshine, not burning up out in the middle of a hot day. We can do things to increase the yield, but God actually gives the yield of how he's designed that plant. That's the way our seed works as well. We have a seed, we should sow it. Look at verses 27 through 29 with talks about him goes to sleep and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow and he not knoweth how for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself first the blade then the ear and then after that the full corn in the ear but when the fruit is brought forth immediately he put forth in the sickle because the harvest <coughs> is come and it's the same way with God's word someday there's going to be a harvest Someday, as he promised, remember Platon's sermon a week ago today, that he promised those that are in Christ are going to have a reunion with those that have gone on before that are in Christ. And that's the harvest. When the trumpet sounds, and those that are dead in Christ shall rise and meet him in the air, and the remaining will be called up. That's the, that's the harvest. That's the sickle. And that's the result of people sowing their seed. That's the result of people being light. It's because of that very thing. The success of the gospel doesn't depend on your power or my power to change somebody's heart. I, we can't do anything to make the gospel more acceptable. It's acceptable as it is. You can't manipulate it. You can't manipulate the will or emotions. But notice something. I'll say this. People that do that are not preaching the gospel. They try to make the, make the message more receivable, to make concessions. People that try to manipulate people's emotions to accept the gospel. 
Why? Why do? You, where does it say in the scriptures that we should manipulate someone's emotions to make the gospel more appealing? It doesn't. It doesn't say. It, it doesn't say that I have the authority or any any preacher has the authority to omit or add to the message to make it more appealing to receive the gospel. It's just not there. False teachers will do that. <clears throat> False teachers will do that. So we can't do that. Those are the things that are automatic. Solely in the hands of God. Just like, again, we'll just go back to a tomato plant. Real easy to do. A lot of people plant tomatoes, whether in a bucket or alongside the house or in the garden or whatever. You can, you can put forth effort, but you cannot physically make a tomato. You can create an environment where a tomato will grow, right? And that's the same way as us as Christians. It's our job to create an environment to where God's word will be heard and believed and understood and a change can be made in people's life. That's why we do what we do. That's why we come here to, to teach children. We, we meet up here to, to offer our worship, but also I offer encouragement and maybe hopefully some understanding through these sermons to folks is we're trying to create an environment where those that do not understand might come to that understanding. That's our job as Christians. So that we can listen and to be obedient. And then we can also have the confidence. Verse 30, Jesus says, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it with? How do you see the kingdom of God? How do you see the family of God? Is it just your family, your immediate family? Is that, is that the kingdom of God in your mind's eye? Or is it Locust Grove Christian Church? Is this the kingdom of God? Or do we have an understanding that it is the church in the whole? It's all the people from the beginning that receive Christ all the way up until Christ returns. That's the church. That's the family of God. It's really, really much bigger than we can fathom in our mind. But yet... We can have the confidence that that family does exist. Jesus said if we had the faith of what? Remember? A mustard seed. And most everybody's already got their mustard planted. Turnip. Those are little old teeny tiny seeds. Little little thing. But if you leave a mustard plant to go to seed, as they call it, it'll grow this tall. It'll have branches up. See a small bird land in it. That's what Jesus is talking about in that parable. That it starts off really small, but it grows and it grows and it branches off and people are, and birds are able to take rest in it and refuge under it. And it's the same way with the church. Once that little seed takes root and begins to do what God wants it to do, many people can benefit from it. And we can have that confidence in our seed as well. And it is God's will, and I'll finish with this one last scripture reference in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. It is the will of God that all should come to salvation. All should come to salvation. Verse chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 9, excuse me. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou was slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of what? Every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. That salvation, that seed, that light is available to everybody. That is God's will. It doesn't say here, when talking about Jesus opening up the seals, that... Uh, out of every person that has done uh, nothing but good their whole life, out of every person that that uh, received Christ uh, by the time they, they was 12 or, or whatever you wanted to throw in there. There's no conditions except one, that you receive Christ because he redeemed us. He says, hath redeemed us to God by the blood. Out of every kindred, out of tongue, people, and nation, out of every tribe is that kindred. So the requirement for that is that we hear and understand the truth. And when we 
hear it and we understand it, then we're going to accept Christ as our Savior. And that's where we are this morning. It's my prayer that this morning and this sermon has created an environment where maybe someone that is here today that does not know Christ will say, wait a minute, I understand that. Or maybe not today, maybe this week they're going to think about it. Maybe somebody on one of these uh, videos is going to be watching it and they're going to say, hold it, I understand that. I've heard it for years, I've heard it for years, but I understand it today. And once you have that understanding that there is no hope, no permanent hope of peace, joy, happiness, and it more abundantly until you have Christ, when you have that understanding, then you're going to do nothing but, nothing to stop you to get to Christ. When you realize that your salvation depends solely upon Christ, there's nothing going to stand in the way of you coming to Christ. And I just ask us, where are we at this morning? Maybe there's some here that have had a relationship for some time, but they lacked a little bit of understanding. And you need to rededicate yourself to that. That's wonderful. You can do that. I encourage you to do that. Maybe there's someone here this morning that suddenly they have understanding. And they say, oh my gosh, now I understand. What do I do? Well, here's what you do. You've heard, and now you believe because you understand. Confess Christ is your Savior. Repent of your sins. Be buried with him in baptism for the forgiveness of those sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide you to plant your seed or to shine in your life. Be faithful until Christ returns until we're called away to heaven. That's what you do. We're going to sing this hymn of invitation this morning. Lord, I'm coming home, and that's really what it is. You're coming home. You're coming to where God wants you to be, where God intends you to be. And I just open that invitation up to anyone. But even though you may not come today, that invitation never ends. You don't have to accept Christ at, at uh, 12.02 on Sunday mornings, and that's the only valid time. It's valid any time you want to, to come to Christ. But you have a decision. Would you come as we stand and sing? First and third verse of this hymn, Lord, I'm coming home.